Transformers Animated, Trial of Megatron, Part 1, Act 1. We open with a Cybertronian newsreel of Optimus Prime and his crew leading the captured Megatron, Shockwave, and Lugnut through the streets of Iacon to a cheering crowd of Autobots. Narration and soundbite interviews with Optimus, Bumblebee, Ratchet, Jazz, RC, and Bulkhead serve to reintroduce our heroes not only to our audience, but also to the Cybertronian population at large. Optimus Prime remains the humble bot next door, just doing his job. Despite the fact that he carries the Magnus Hammer, the weapon associated with Autobot Supreme Commander Ultra Magnus. I haven't had the chance to return it to him, Optimus shrugs. Bumblebee basks in the adulation. And they all thought I'd never amount to anything in boot camp. In your face plates, losers! Ratchet is cranky, but glad to be home. Jazz plays it cool as usual. R.C. is a bit disoriented from the millions of stellar cycles she missed while Memory Core wiped. Bulkhead is overwhelmed by all the attention. Optimus's crew has become overnight Cybertronian celebrities, thanks to the efforts of bombastic media bot Uplink. It's a real Cybertronian Cinderella story, and the press is eating up the humble space bridge repair bots term planetary heroes, much in the way the Detroit media did when the Autobots arrived on Earth. And what a story it is! We learn of their amazing and unlikely recovery of the AllSpark, the long-lost source of all Cybertronian life, as well as a large number of protoforms, the blank, sparkless, liquid metal Cybertronian bodies long ago stolen by the Decepticons. The Autobot Council has entrusted these sources of the next generation of Autobots to their former guardians. The Cyber Ninja Corps, led by Sensei Dai Atlas, and whose members include Jazz. However, Acting Magnus Sentinel Prime publicly criticizes the Council's decision to place the future of Cybertron in the servos of a bunch of superstitious crankcases. Uplink also notes a couple of other curiosities among Optimus Prime's unlikely band of heroes. Firstly, their ship is actually the giant Autobot known as Omega Supreme, a doomsday weapon of last resort, long thought taken offline and melted down for spare parts after the great Autobot Decepticon Wars. But on the street soundbite interviews indicate the Autobots are not entirely comfortable with this reminder of their dark past walking amongst them. Secondly, Optimus Prime's crew also includes the techno-organic humanoid curiosity known as Sari. If the bots on the street are uncomfortable with Omega Supreme, they're downright phobic of anything remotely organic, or at the very least, grossed out. Uplink declares Optimus Prime responsible for the single most significant Autobot victory since the great Autobot Decepticon Wars. Uplink even suggests that Optimus would make an excellent Magnus and the bot-on-the-street reactions show an overwhelming number of Autobots in favor of Optimus as successor to the gravely injured Ultra Magnus. However, Sentinel, in a soundbite interview, downplays his rival's Magnus potential, as well as his recent achievements. I caught my share of cons myself, he declares to Uplink. It's one thing to catch him, it's quite another to keep him caught. And where does Sentinel Prime keep him caught? in the brand-new, state-of-the-art Trypticon prison, located in the heart of what was once the Decepticon capital city of Kaon. Here we see Decepticon prisoners Megatron, Shockwave, Lugnut, Blitzwing, Sycophant Starscream clone, and Liar Starscream clone, stripped of their weapons, stasis-cuffed and mouth-clamped, while attended to by Minicons, smaller, semi-sentient, human-sized Autobots, who communicate via R2-D2-style beeps, buzzes, and flashing lights. Uplink questions the wisdom of imprisoning the Decepticons in their own former capital city. Sentinel scoffs. It's not enough to defeat the enemy. You have to break his spirit. Sure, Optimus and his maintenance bots caught a lucky break here. But we can never forget we're still at war. Sentinel brags that his elite guard forces have cut off the remaining Decepticons' main energon supply. A starving enemy is a weak enemy, he boasts. Uplink counters that a starving enemy is also an enemy with nothing to lose. Sentinel looks directly into the camera and smiles. Bring it on. 
Of course, every war has its casualties, narrates Uplink, as we learn of the heroic sacrifice of one of Optimus Prime's crew, the Cyber Ninja Prowl. From that, we see to Cyber Ninja Dojo, last seen in Five Servos of Doom, where our heroes have gathered for a memorial to their fallen comrade. Jazz presides over the ceremony. Prowl's shell may be offline, but his spark still grooves with us. And that ain't no jive. His spark's in tight with the all-spark itself. And thanks to Prowl, some solar cycle, a brand spanking new generation of Autobots will get to make the scene from these protoforms we sprung from the con. Among the assembled group, R.C. stares longingly at the recovered protoforms. In the meantime, I'm just a teaching unit with no young bots to teach. Sari turns to R.C. and offers. You could teach me. I've got a lot to learn about my Cybertronian half. From protoform this shell once sparked, declares Jazz, and to protoform it shall return. Prowl's lifeless shell is then lowered into a forge, where it's melted down into a new protoform, which joins the rows of protoforms in the vault of the dojo. When the ceremony is complete, a distracted sentinel saunters in. So, what did I miss? Everything, replies Optimus. As usual, adds Ratchet under his breath. Sentinel reminds Optimus that he has a lot of responsibilities as Magnus. Sentinel goes on to say he doesn't have time to pay tribute to every glitch detail jockey that goes offline. We then reveal Uplink, who caught every one of Sentinel's insensitive comments on camera. Sentinel instantly goes into spin control mode, which is why I make it a point to attend memorials for great Cybertronian heroes like Pow Wow. That's Prowl, corrects Optimus. Why, what did I say? asks a clearly oblivious sentinel, who then pulls Optimus and Jazz aside and out of audio sensor shot of Uplink. I get it, he whispers. You bots are the greatest thing to hit Cybertron since Cubed Energon. But some of us haven't forgotten how some bots deserted my side, he adds, glaring at Jazz. Then dig this, says Jazz, ripping off his elite guard stripes and handing them to Sentinel. I'm Splitsville on the Elite Guard. From now on, I'm swinging a full-time Cyber Ninja gig. Fine, replies a seething sentinel. As long as we're returning things, he says, turning to Optimus, how about handing over the Magnus Hammer to its rightful owner? Optimus assures Sentinel that he was planning to do just that. Sentinel holds out his hand expectantly. But Optimus walks away with the hammer, telling Sentinel, in fact... I'm on my way to see Ultra Magnus right now. Off Sentinel's chagrined expression, we wipe to Cybertron Central Infirmary, where Optimus returns the hammer to Ultra Magnus, still hooked up to Spark support equipment as we last saw him in This Is Why I Hate Machines. Council Elders Alpha Trion and Perceptor flank their fallen leader as Optimus hands the hammer to Ultra Magnus. The sparking energy flowing through the hammer to Ultra Magnus is enough to temporarily revive him into a moment of lucidity. He knows his time is short and insists on an emergency council meeting right there and then. Optimus offers to contact Sentinel. But Ultra Magnus tells him that won't be necessary. The time has come to name a permanent successor. Sentinel Prime has the elite guard experience, but the Council must also take other factors into consideration. We need a leader who can inspire all Cybertronians and guide us into the future, declares Ultra Magnus. Optimus Prime, I once told you that being a hero wasn't in your programming. I've never been so pleased to be wrong. Recent events have proven you don't need to try to be a hero... You are a hero. A hero that I would be proud to name as my successor. In an image reminiscent of Optimus handing the Matrix of Leadership to Ultra Magnus in Transformers the movie, Ultra Magnus hands the Magnus Hammer back to Optimus, insisting he keep it. Optimus is taken aback. He doesn't know what to say. Everybody's making him out to be some kind of hero, but he's just a bot who's doing his job. Humility, smiles Ultra Magnus. 
Something that would be refreshing to see in a Magnus. And with that, Ultra Magnus's optics grow dim, his readout flatlines, and his shell turns gray, indicating he has finally gone offline. Optimus insists to Alpha Trion and Perceptor that he's not ready to be Magnus. Alpha Trion assures Optimus that he may have the hammer, but he's not Magnus. Yet the Council will make the final decision. But the will of the Autobots will weigh heavily on that decision. We pull back outside the room to reveal Sentinel listening in from the corridor. He's been listening in the whole time. Not if I have anything to do with it, he mutters ominously. As we fade out, Act Two on the Bridge of Omega Supreme. Ratchet excitedly prepares for the grand reopening of his favorite hangout, McAdam's Old Oil House. R.C. is reluctant to go with him. It's not the sort of establishment that a teaching unit would frequent. Ratchet admits the clientele can be a lively bunch, but assures R.C. they're all gentle bots. Omega Supreme, however, declines to join them. I just don't fit in here, Ratchet, he laments. Just because you were built to be a weapon of mass destruction doesn't mean you can't be a valuable member of Cybertronian society, insists Ratchet. No, I mean I don't fit in here, responds Omega Supreme. With that, we reveal robot mode Omega Supreme standing outside McAdams towering over the entire building as Ratchet and R.C. exit down the ramp from his foot. He literally doesn't fit in here. Cybertron just isn't built for his scale. Tell me about it. I feel like I need mountain climbing gear just to sit on a footstool. A group of Autobots angrily tell Omega Supreme to move it. He's blocking traffic. Ratchet comes to his defense, but Omega transforms to ship mode and flies off. For a supposedly advanced race, we Autobots sure have a tough time accepting anyone that's different, Ratchet grumbles to R.C. With that, we whip Pan to Sari, scrambling to avoid the giant feet of organophobic Autobots who shriek at her presence like a cartoon elephant to a mouse. I wouldn't know anything about that. And FYI, I'm only half organic! She shouts to the retreating Autobots. Inside McAdams, Optimus and his crew are treated like celebrities, with every bot in the joint wanting to buy a can of premium oil for the heroes who took down Megatron and brought back the AllSpark. Uplink is there, following Cybertron's new heroes and celebrities around, recording their every move. Much to the chagrin of Sentinel, who fumes at a table in the back with Jetfire and Jetstorm and his loyal Stormtrooper-like police bots. Meanwhile, Bumblebee revels in the adulation and takes the opportunity to rub it in his old boot camp platoon mate Ironhide's face. Bulkhead tries to get his buddy to just let it go. Ratchet and R.C. try to have a conversation, but can't hear one another over the din of noise. Sara is not having much more fun as she scrambles to avoid getting stepped on by giant Autobot feet. She needs her jetpack just to keep at eye level with her Autobot friends. Plus, she's not much of an oil drinker. Apparently, she's got enough AllSpark energy stored up to sustain her indefinitely. Still, I could really go for the burger bot right now. She laments to Bulkhead. Meanwhile, sleazy Autobot Rattletrap, that's me, tries to mooch some oil while shooting his trap off about some rumors he's heard about Optimus Prime actually being named Magnus. He gets Uplink to scan a photo of himself and Optimus for posterity. While Optimus tries to downplay the rumors as mere speculation. But then Sentinel butts in, hopping mad. He's heard the rumors too, and he won't stand for it. Especially the part about Optimus keeping the Magnus Hammer. Optimus tries to calm Sentinel. But Bumblebee makes matters worse by jumping on a table and toasting Optimus Magnus to the cheers of the crowd. Optimus blocks Sentinel from throttling Bumblebee. Leave him alone. 
It's just the oil talking. But Sentinel takes it as an aggressive move and sicks his police bots on Optimus. Which results in a classic barroom brawl as every bot in the joint comes to Optimus's defense. Gentle bots? R.C. says archly to Ratchet as an Autobot comes flying back and smashing into their table. Optimus has to use his jetpack to rescue Sentinel from the angry mob and fly him above the fracas. Uplink captures the whole thing on his vid scanners and broadcasts the story on the Cybertron Information Network the next day, clearly pinning the blame for the brawl on Sentinel's abuse of power and repeatedly showing the footage of Sentinel's humiliating rescue by Optimus. Uplink urges the bots of Cybertron to be the judges on who would make the better Magnus. Sentinel's energy lance smashes the giant vid screen displaying the broadcast. He needs some spin control and fast. Later in a Cybertronium classroom, R.C. eagerly prepares her materials for sorry Cybertronian education. Ratchet shows up with a gift for R.C., sort of an apology for their disastrous night out at McAdams. It's a pair of laser swords. I was trying to make laser pointers for your lectures, but I think I got a little carried away. Ah, R.C. thinks it was very thoughtful of him. R Ratchet stammers that maybe they could try again to have a night out together. Somewhere quiet this time. R.C. smiles. I'd like that. Then how about tonight? asks an eager Ratchet. Before R.C. can answer, however, Ironhide rolls into the classroom and informs Ratchet he is to report to the Metroplex right away on orders of acting Magnus Sentinel Prime. Ratchet reluctantly rolls off with Ironhide. A little later, Ironhide and Ratchet arrive in the former Project Omega Lab, where Sentinel has assembled Cybertron's top scientific minds and technicians, including Perceptor, Wheeljack, and Red Alert. Ratchet remembers this place all too well. Whatever Sentinel has in mind, it can't possibly be good. Sentinel explains that their task is to design and build him a suit of armor that will inspire the respect and awe of Autobot and Decepticon alike. Oh, and it has to fly. Some bots feeling a little inadequate. Classic case of hammer envy, mumbles Ratchet. Sentinel promises to divert any and all necessary resources to Project Power Master. Now get cracking! I expect results within a deca cycle. As Sentinel leaves, Ratchet grumbles. And maybe while we're at it, we can turn water into energy. Wipe to deep space, where an oil tanker-like cargo ship transports a shipment of energon to the asteroid posts on the far edge of the galaxy. Beachcomber captains the ship, muttering to himself that this has to be the most boring job in the entire Cybertronian service, except space bridge repair. I'd have to delete my own code if I got stuck with that assignment. Space bridge repair. Yuck. Suddenly, all the lights go out, and the ship powers down. Oh, no. Beachcomber chalks it up to a faulty fuse? But outside the ship, we see the true cause, as Decepticon Blackout clings to the side of the ship, punching his way through the hull and grabbing Beachcoma. Uh, who reacts in typical laid-back style? Dude, that is so not cool. I'm like... Totally alone, totally unarmed, and totally not paid enough to put up a fight. So just take the energon, and it's totally casual, okay? But Blackout clearly has much more lethal intent, as he literally drained the life out of Beachcomber. The weakening Beachcomber asks, Seriously, dude, what do you get by taking me offline? A message, replies Blackout. Casting Beachcomber's limp body off into space, he transforms to ship mode and tows the cargo ship 
as we fade out. Act three, back in R.C.'s classroom. R.C. lectures Sari on the basics of Cybertronian life. Protoforms are molded into shells and infused with the spark of life by the AllSpark. I never thought I'd say this, but I kind of miss Tutorbot. R.C. smacks her laser pointer sword on Sari's desk. Care to share your comments with the rest of the class? Um, I am the rest of the class. Fortunately for her, Bulkhead and Bumblebee interrupt the lecture with a fuel break in the form of Burger Bot Burgers. How did you... Bumblebee explains that Bulkhead pulled a few strings at the Space Bridge Nexus and presto, transwarp takeout fresh from Earth. And while I was there, I managed to install a subspace tachyon transmitter on top of some deck tower, adds Bulkhead. Why does some Jack Tower need a subspace transmitter? Wonder Sari, with a mouthful of Big Bot Burger. Hello, Sari, answers a familiar voice. Sari turns to see some Jack on the Viz screen. Daddy! She cries in delight. Some Jack reveals he's been busy investigating strange crystalline formations that have been springing up all around Detroit. Bulkhead instantly recognized the crystalline growth as raw energon. He saw enough of the stuff growing up on the energon farm, so he ought to know. But how did it suddenly start forming on Earth? Chemical reaction from the AllSpark shield Prowl made when we last fought Megatron. Sari replies knowingly. R.C. compliments her star pupil on her intuitive understanding of Cybertronian geology. Must be the protoform in me. Sari shrugs, standing next to a sample protoform in the classroom. So, does it look like my baby pictures? Hmm, some duck doesn't recognize the protoform. Are they all that big? He asks. The one he found in his lab was human size. That's impossible, insists R.C. Protoforms are uniform size. Sari suddenly looks worried. Then what am I? Bumblebee promises to get Sari the answers she's looking for. What do you know about it? Bumblebee insists it's not what you know, but who you know. Dissolve to the AllSpark, now housed along with the protoforms in the Cyber Ninja Dojo's protoform chamber. Sari and Bumblebee stand before the AllSpark. Accompanied by Optimus, who thanks Jazz for letting them in. Anything for the big brass top cat, replies Jazz. Optimus insists he's not top anything yet. Don't sell yourself short, Big Bot, nudges Bumblebee. In case you haven't noticed, your name opens doors on this planet. Sari's not sure what to ask the AllSpark. Her previous conversations with it haven't exactly been wordy. But suddenly an image begins to form within the glowing energy of the AllSpark. An image of Prowl. He tells Sari to stop looking to the past to find her future. Once you carried a key, now you are the key. The key to the future of Cybertron and Earth. Sari doesn't care about all that. She wants to know who she is, what she is. Make the AllSpark tell me, she insists. Prowl explains that he cannot control the AllSpark. He is merely part of the AllSpark, fulfilling its will. So what is its will? What does it want? What the old spark has always wanted, and what it always will want, replies Prowl. Life. The old spark then projects three separate images in front of Sari, Optimus, and Bumblebee. Sari sees a Cybertronian spark merging with a DNA double helix. Optimus sees an image of himself growing to Megatron's scale and grappling with the Decepticon. Bumblebee sees an image of himself wearing an elite guard symbol. What's that supposed to mean? I don't know, replies Bumblebee, but I like it. Later, on the streets of Iacon, whose giant billboards are plastered with images of Optimus carrying the Magnus Hammer. Sentinel walks with Cliffjumper, pleading with him to try and dig up some dirt on Optimus. So, you're asking me to waste Cybertron Intel resources just to make you look good? Cliffjumper asks incredulously. It's not about making me look good, asserts Sentinel. 
It's about making him look worse. Cliff Jumper insists it's still not part of his job. Not an official part of your job, Counter Sentinel. That's why I'm asking you here, outside the Metroplex. Not as your superior, but as your friend. You're neither, replies Cliff Jumper. And as far as I'm concerned, this conversation never happened. Sentinel calls to Cliff Jumper, who walks away. So are you going to help me with this or what? But another voice calls to Sentinel from the shadows. I can help you. It's Rattletrap, who insists he's a bot of all trades who knows how to get stuff. He offers Sentinel a photo of Optimus palling around with Megatron, who has his arm around Optimus's shoulder. It's obviously a sloppily cropped image of the photo of Rattletrap and Optimus in McAdams, with Megatron's head inserted over Rattletrap. Sentinel shoves Rattletrap aside, confiscating the photo and threatening to have Rattletrap arrested if he ever sees him again. Sentinel walks away, examining the photo, musing to himself, You know, if we clean this up, it might actually work. Meanwhile, Bulkhead returns to the Energon farm on Cybertron's moon. He has a sample of the raw Energon he transwarped in from Sumdac on Earth, which looks much healthier than the withered crystalline formations growing in the fields. Tractor, a grizzled old farmer bot, test Bulkhead sample. It's ten times more potent than raw Cybertronian Energon. Unfortunately... It's got organic components, so they couldn't grow it on Cybertron. Too bad, though, muses Tractor, looking at the dismal Energon crystals in the field. Crops been getting worse every year. Holding up Bulkhead's Earth Energon sample, Tractor declares, Whoever controls this stuff controls the future of Cybertron. Cut to Sentinel's office in Fortress Maximus, where Sentinel, flanked by Jetfire and Jetstorm, has summoned Bumblebee. I'm talking about the future of Cybertron, Sentinel purrs to Bumblebee. But mostly, I'm talking about your future, in the Elite Guard. We need heroes like you. I need heroes like you. Bumblebee is taken aback. Wow, it's almost like the Allspark willed it or something. Sentinel smiles, holding out an Elite Guard symbol tantalizingly to Bumblebee. Now, of course, there's just the small matter of your public endorsement of me as Magnus. Bumblebee's face falls. He knew there had to be a catch. He's not sure he could betray Optimus like that. Don't think of it as betraying Optimus, asserts Sentinel. Think of it as securing your destiny. Bumblebee is torn. He asks Sentinel if he can think about it. Absolutely, says Sentinel. You have one solar cycle. After Bumblebee leaves... Jetfire and Jetstorm question why Sentinel must resort to bribery to gain endorsements. Sentinel insists this is war and he's doing what has to be done. But it's still not enough. He still needs some bot to shadow Optimus and dig up some dirt on him. Jetfire and Jetstorm volunteer. But Sentinel shoots that down. They're too obviously in his camp. At that moment, Ironhide rushes in with an important message for Sentinel. Who ignores him while he muses... I need some bot anonymous, some bot you'd never notice, some bot who just fades into the background and doesn't call attention to himself. The whole time he says this, Ironhide tries in vain to get Sentinel's attention. Until Jetfire and Jetstorm finally point him out. Sorry, didn't notice you there. Say, the gears suddenly turn in Sentinel's head. Ironhide reports increased Decepticon activity moving in toward Cybertron from the Galactic Rim. But Sentinel is more fixated on his plan. He offers Ironhide a new assignment as Optimus Prime's Shell Guard. Clearly a great hero like Optimus is a Cybertronian treasure that needs protection. He tells Ironhide to stick to Optimus like space barnacles and report back on everything he observes. Everything. Back on the Energon farm, Bulkhead relaxes, remarking how much more peaceful and quiet it is here, not like the hustle and bustle of Cybertron. Unfortunately, that peace and quiet is short-lived, as a Decepticon strike team, led by General Obsidian, swoops down on the Energon fields, and we fade out. (laughs) 